I am joined today by Sean Wessenberg. Sean is an engineering leader with deep technical knowledge, as well as an ability to engage, motivate, and inspire action in others. He is currently the Director of Engineering at Stormforge, and prior to that, has led multiple engineering teams at Minnesota-based companies, including Optum, Boston Scientific, and Best Buy. Sean, thank you so much for being in my orbit and for joining me today on Couple of Conversations. Thank you so much, Lauren, for having me. Well, I'm excited to talk with you today about how you stay in love with your craft. And speaking of which, it's my understanding that when you were growing up, you never wanted to spend your days in front of a computer. So I'm wondering, how did you get into this? Why did you pick software engineering? <laughs> right. Um, so that story is true. And I think it stemmed from uh, very young playing video games. And I was, uh, you know, always kind of entranced with there has to be so much code behind this to facilitate these interactions and all this stuff. It must just be miserable being a human sitting behind a screen, eight hour plus days, uh, just, just writing lines of code. So that's kind of how I grew up. Um, I've always been kind of, um, I guess drawn to technology in, in kind of innate curiosity in terms of, Hey, what is the latest, greatest thing? But like, what can that do? What can that unlock? And so by the time I got to, um, junior high, high school, you know, I, you start to think about, you know, your career path or, or maybe I do, maybe other people don't. <laughs> And and at the end of the day, I was already doing so much technology. I was doing coding, networking classes, um, setting up websites, kind of hacking around. Um, I was like, you know what? This this profession is forecasted to be this. I'm already kind of engaged with it. Um, you know, I think people will probably pay me for this. And I, I think I can enjoy it enough because once you dive in, there's so much variety. It's it's easily overwhelming, but kind of endlessly. Um, <laughs> I'm bordering on frustrating and entertaining because <laughs> anyone that's worked in this knows uh, how frustrating technology can be. Uh, but but also like the end goal of oh wow like um, we're connecting people in new ways. We're unlocking new potential. So so yeah, that was kind of it. And then. Um, went off to college and basically spent like 50, 50 time, 50% in, in the classroom and 50% really just hacking away at, um, all, all things web. So it goes back pretty far. <laughs> awesome. Well, and I'm curious cause your journey too, you've gone from being an individual contributor to leading people back to an individual contributor. And I see a lot of folks in my network who make a similar type of trajectory where it's you go from hands on the keyboard every day to then you get promoted to leading people and you're getting further away from your craft. What do you think of that? And is that, is that good for everybody? Is that something everybody should do or uh, no? <laughs> yeah. Between leadership and individual contributor. Um, it's a question I've actually got a lot from people that have reported to me as well. It is not for everyone. Um, I've had the privilege of actually working for companies where they acknowledge that individual contributors that are awesome should probably stay individual contributors and keep going because the skill set to manage people is just completely different. Um, and I, I will tell you, every single company I've worked at, plus had interviews at throughout my career, everybody does it differently. They want different percentages of hands-on versus people leader. Um, and as an individual contributor, um, you know, you got to think about what your growth path wants to be. Do you want to be a coach where you're, you're sacrificing your own skills, but you're improving others and you're, you know, putting empathy forward and you're thinking about, um, you know, kind of the longer term health of the team and not just applications, right? Because um, really it's about maximizing all the people around you and, you know, reporting into you to say, how do we structure things and, and you know, make everybody happy, which is just about impossible, uh, but also complete objectives and, and all that. So, um, yeah, I've I've been fortunate to be in both and actually flip back and forth. Uh, the reason that I 
um, and this might help folks out there that are thinking about management. I, I don't want to discourage people from it. Um, just go into it knowing I'm going to be there for other people. And, you know, that's my objective. Um, why I kind of folded back is I felt like I was losing, you know, when I had 20 plus people reporting to me, you know, across four or five different teams, it was a little overwhelming. I felt like I was losing touch and I wanted to, I don't know, get back to my roots a little bit and be like, I can still develop, I can still code, um, which is very interesting uh, mindset to have because before that I was doing it for over a decade. So, but you know, you play mind games with yourself. Like, can I do that? And it's like, yeah, you can. Uh, but it does, it does take effort and um, to kind of reclaim some of those skills. So. Do you think it's tough for folks who move up the ladder, get the big titles, director, senior director, VP, do you think it's also challenging that if you wanted to get back to doing what you really loved, that you'd have to sacrifice that title that you work so hard for and maybe compensation along with it? I mean, is that also a challenge where not every company has done well by allowing individual contributors to move up in compensation and status at a company and still stay in their craft? Is that something you've noticed that's a challenge too for folks? Certainly. Um, and I know, you know, if I ever need another job, it's, it's going to be a challenge for me too. Um, because how you, how you tailor the way you present yourself, the roles you go after, what your job title is, um, that kind of sets you up for, oh, well, you know, we have four teams over here. Do you want to manage those four teams? And it's like, well, I like to like be in the weeds a little bit in the details, push things forward. Um, with four teams, you're not going to be doing that unless you're, you're, people are going to probably hate you. Um, I think there is more wiggle room at the smaller companies where you do have, you know, VPs, directors wearing multiple hats going across multiple domains. Uh, but certainly, you know, if you're at a large company like, you know, at, you know, United Health or Best Buy, uh, director level, you're having at least four teams, if not five to eight. Um, and you're really just sitting in meetings all day, kind of steering the ship or doing what you can to steer the ship. Um, so it, it's kind of tough. At the same time, um, it's very interesting when you're promoted up into those roles. Um, and maybe for someone out there that is, you know, getting promoted up, their senior engine manager, their associate director, director, um, you're probably doing something right. Um, and I don't want to have people, you know, be discouraged from that and kind of lean away from it. Um, but yeah, the, the, comp the compensation piece uh, frankly, it's just all over the board. And with the recent tech layoffs, it's even more all over the board, right? Some companies are still super high. I, I see some companies where it's, it's, uh, you, you, you kind of question like, you know, for a college degree or, you know, six, 10 years plus of experience, like how, you know, how, how are you getting away with paying someone that much? Um, so that that is just a tricky question. It's going to vary all over the board. Yeah, no, very good point. And I do think that what also varies, as you mentioned, is different companies demand different things of their leadership. So I know some companies where the CTO is still doing 400 code commits a year, and you've got other companies where engineering managers haven't you know, written a single line of code in a few years, right? It's not their expectation. So I do think it can be tricky navigating that just solely looking at titles never really gives you a good indication. Um, I'm curious, you've solved so many problems. You've solved a lot of problems and maybe a lot of the same problems. Do you feel like there are new problems to solve for you? And what I'm really getting at here is how do you stay fulfilled when you might feel like you've already been there and done it all? That's a great question because I'm coming up on 20 years of doing this, um, at least professionally, even longer before that. Um, I'll say this for me, it, um, I will fully admit, um, and I actually have other engineers that I'm good friends with 
and they feel the same way where it's like, we've done all of this. We've like, we've coded it all. And so when you're looking at job descriptions or companies hiring out there, Hey, we need someone that does Java. And it's like, Oh man, I did 10 years at Java. Like, and I, I, I felt like I was away from it. Do I really want to dive back in there? Um, I, I think the, you can take it one of two ways. I think you can um, focus on the problems and less on the technology and uh, don't in, in that same vein, what I t- try to recommend engineers is um, you want to care about what you're doing. You want to have quality work, but at the same time, you don't, you don't want to get attached to it um, because at the end of the day, like I've been on projects you work on for three to six months and then they, they get killed off and you're like, what did I just do? So you have to, you have to look kind of step beyond that and look at the bigger picture of, you know, what am I solving here? Um, and just in general, that's probably a great perspective. So you're not just using technology to use technology. I think the other part of it is, and kind of my mind, how it works is, I've jumped into so many different areas. So, you know, when I started my career, it was kind of top down, do everything because I was one of two people at a very small company. And actually when I shifted to go work at, you know, Best Buy, um, I felt a little bit exhausted because technology is, there's so much breadth to it, but I was also very confused by the term like front end developer or front end engineer. I was like, what do you mean? You just code UI? Like, no, that there's like so much more to that. Um, and then of course with my career, it's okay. Do, do basically front end at Best Buy, then do, you know, infrastructure, Kubernetes, cloud stuff at, um, Boston scientific, and then go do data warehouse stuff at, at Optum. And then at Stormforge, uh, do platform services and, um, kind of all the stuff I've done throughout my career. So that's another avenue for people to, you know, stay interested. The, the, the well is very deep and the tech is very broad. Um, but yeah, I, I will freely admit doing the same thing over and over and over is just not, not how I find joy in anything. Um, and I'll tell you what, like as a programmer, the first thing I do is try to automate that away and be like, you know what, if I do this one thing, I never have to do that again. So why don't I just spend my time doing that? So, <laughs> Does it feel like for the past two decades, you've rented your brain out? Um, yes. Um, I'm just thinking through like all the stuff I've been through in the last two decades I'm sure many people out there have gone through the same thing where at the end of the day, you just kind of feel exhausted and you need your brain to actually do something like very simple. Like one of the things that actually self soothes for like, you know, a lot of the craziness and some of the roles I've had is just like, Hey, I'm going to take the next four hours and just write unit tests. And you're like, why is this guy writing unit tests? And it's like, cause my brain just needs to relax because thinking about everything, um, it's a little bit overwhelming, you know, and thinking about it in the detail that it requires to actually understand it. So yeah, definitely. Is there this feeling too, like you always have to be on the bleeding edge? Like I hear that term a lot and I also know there's still companies on the mainframe. So like it, it, I hear it and then there's sort of this uh, reality that not every company is working with the latest and greatest, but I feel like the expectations are for engineers to always be ever learning, which I think is great. In a lot of ways, we love to learn, we love to grow and challenge ourselves as human beings. But is there also this constant pressure that you need to be, there's no other way. And if you don't, then you're some sort of failure in this capacity. I'm curious how you balance that sort of demand in the marketplace. Yeah, and that is a really tough one. Because, um, when I was doing a ton of hiring and, you know, looking for people to join my team, one of the things I always looked for was, um, you know, and thinking about it now, is it fair or not? But it was, what do you kind of do in your free time? And specifically what I'm looking for is how do you learn as a person and how do you, 
how are you reaching out, having your brain reach out and acquiring new things? Um, and like you said, I think that's a very important skill set. I will say as someone that um, <laughs> a much younger version of myself was always on the bleeding edge. I didn't have obligations. It was just me. <laughs> I was I was single at the time. I wasn't married. I didn't have kids. Um, sure. I, I could throw down, you know, 12, 16 hour days and just go to town and absorb everything, you know, be on the bleeding edge, break stuff. Um, I don't think that's necessarily sustainable and I don't think that's necessarily want to be. I would say to people, um, find an area that you're, you're interested in, you think you could do for, you know, four to five years, um, really nail that expertise down. And then, um, you know, I think not just engineers in general, but everyone um, with the rapid pace of society and innovations uh, has to be adaptable. And, and part of that is is growing and learning. So, yeah, yeah it's uh, but, I, you know, to be honest with everybody out there, I've, I've stayed up uh, at night being like, I just need a few more hours in the day so I can learn this and then, you know, I'll be valuable again. Um, but I think we have to tell ourselves like, you know what, take a break, go exercise, go do something that's other than technology. Um, and then, you know, set aside time to, okay, what, what do I want to do? What I want to grow, um, you know, and, and not go too broad, but. Yeah. There's a famous line by Jim Rohn, who is a public speaker in the eighties. And he said, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. And your your job will see you'll see it played out in your career that you will ultimately end up doing well because to your point you take care of yourself you have greater energy you have more capacity to learn and push yourself and maybe more passion behind it. What would you say if you could go back in time? What do you wish you knew before you walk down this road? What's something like with the next generation of engineers in mind? I know we're in a different world than we were two decades ago, yeah. or a decade ago, but you know, specifically to you, what do you wish you knew before you started down this road that maybe would have changed the course? That's a tough one. Because when I think back to myself and my younger career, I feel like I was pretty naive in my skill set. And I was like, hey, everybody's giving me great compliments. And I must be like the awesomest developer ever. And like, that will just carry me through. Um, which is fine, but try to keep a head on your shoulders in terms of Hey, you solved one things, but you, you solved one thing, but just know there's a million people out there that probably solved the same thing. Um, but I think using that energy, that kind of inexperience to really drive yourself forward and be like, you know what, let me just latch onto this cool idea and go for it and build a mobile app or something. I think that's probably the most important thing to like find something. And if you're like, have some momentum behind it, see it through to as far as you can get it. Um, and basically use that as like, Hey, I did this thing. Like, um, I think that's, that's the most important piece of advice I would give to the young folks is just, um, you know, picking something, seeing it through and, and being able to speak to it. Outside of the discipline of seeing it through, do you think people need to love what they do? Or can this just be a job? Like, like shoveling horse shit. I just need to get it done. Someone has to do it. Like I get mixed feelings from people on this. Like, do you really have to love writing code or can you just, can it just be a job? I'm of the mind that it can just be a job and I'll caveat that with, but that doesn't mean you don't put effort into it. I think one of the most dangerous things that happen with people is they take a hobby or something they love and they're like, oh, I'll just go do that and make money with, with it. Um, in about like three to five years, you will probably hate what you're doing. <laughs> um, but like now you're just making money off of it. So I think it's important to understand yourself and um, say to yourself, like, can I just do this as a job? And I don't want anyone to be miserable in a job. I'm sure there's plenty of like leaders out there and company executives that be like, no one should just show up and do a job. It's like, you know what? At the end of the day, especially in today's reality, 
like the big corporation doesn't really care about you. Everybody is at the end replaceable. I would encourage people to empower yourself to say, what am I getting out of this job? Is it just a paycheck? Is it networking? Is it skills? And kind of lean into that and say, you know, am I happy? I, I've, I've worked with a lot of people that have been at a place for over a decade and they're like, should I move? Should I go do something? It's like, well, one, like, is the company stable? Are you happy with what you're doing? Do you feel satisfied with life? Like, is do you really want to chase the carrot, essentially? Um, I know in my career, it's like, no, like, in some environments with some businesses, like, I don't want to chase that carrot because I care about, more about going on a bike ride or doing some other weird, quirky project that I'll never get any money for, but um, again, it's, it's satisfying my brain. So it's, it's fine. I'm glad you brought that up about the corporations. I think and maybe you would agree with this. I almost think that people would be a lot better off if they didn't feel like they were supposed to be a part of a family or this is, we're going to work because of the mission of a company. I sometimes think that that's a lot of the corporate emphasis on the mission. And this is why we're doing things. I'm not saying that that isn't good for good culture, but I think what happens is people grow quickly disillusioned when half their team gets laid off or when they get laid off and it comes down to finances and planning, right? And that, that happens. And I think especially the more years that pass in this career, it can be really hard to go from corporation to corporation and find it's the different color badge, but it's the same type of problems or the same experience. And I am curious, do you think if people had a little bit more of a sober, less sentimental approach to the job that they were at, that they would do better psychologically as opposed to walking in thinking, this is, I'm supposed to be a part of a family and we're all have, we all have the same North star and we all belong. I'm just curious how you reconcile that. I would say based on my personal experiences, yes. Um, because I think when you bring certain energies into the workplace, um, and certain mentalities, like being a family is one thing, but like overly caring about your job and like how things get done, you will cause a lot of people to hate you. <laughs> Some people will essentially tell themselves like, oh, well, you know, everybody should care about this at this company. And it's like, but no, a lot of people don't. So like stop forcing it on people because otherwise people are going to quit and leave. So yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I, um, you know, at the end of the day, they call it a business because it's a business and there's a balance sheet and there's objectives that have to be hit. And I, I would, I would ask people like, if, if you weren't getting paid, let's just say like, you know, you could live a decent life, uh, but you weren't getting paid for a job. Would you still show up every day and do the work? Um, now, I know me personally, I would still be coding and doing stuff because that's just who it, that's just what my brain requires. Um, I am fortunate to work with a great group of people where I can show up and be like, yeah, I have no problem showing up to work. I actually wish we had more meetings so I could talk to more people. <laughs> Um, but you know, the reality is that's not the case for everybody. So think about what you are getting out of it. And you, you, you know, you bring up a perfect thing of, uh, you know, the, the layoffs have been so sad recently, you know, recently, and I get like these big companies should have never overhired. Um, I would personally like to see, you know, some, some leadership at the top, take some responsibility instead of just, Hey, we're just going to lay off 10,000 people because we overhired. So, you know, it's a, it's a sad reality that as an employee, um, you know, and, and you're not going to go start your own company if you don't want to do that. Cause I know a lot of people don't, not everyone's like you, Lauren, <laughs> <laughs> um, because that's a lot of work. Um, you know, you have to think about yourself and take care of yourself and, and do what you can to prepare for the unexpected of, you know, whatever's out there. So, yeah. Are you worried about this next generation of software engineers? And I suppose with the backdrop of AI, with also a lot of, I think, disillusionment, I have noticed that. I don't say that lightly. I talk to a lot of people and I think 
23 and 24 um, have been really tough years already for, for folks. And so I am wondering, how do you feel about the next generation coming to the market, especially with, with AI and maybe with some of these recent challenges given the macro economy? Um, yes. Um, I feel for young people out there because, uh, when I was coming up, the only way to get a computer to do stuff was hire an engineer, a software engineer to do it. Um, we are going to see more and more. Um, and then, you know, obviously with automation, you're writing lines of code to automate something so the computer can do it with artificial intelligence and, you know, these large language models, the, the prevailing thing is it's going to start automating a lot of those tasks without needing someone to write code. Um, so I think in terms of how people approach this, I would say this, if you're thinking of your career from the standpoint of, you know, I'm great at writing computer code and I just want to write computer code all day. I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's a meaningful career path. Um, maybe for the next five to 10 to 15, 20 years. Uh, but eventually that's gonna, that's gonna die out. I would encourage people to say, you can still get it, get those skills and that understanding. I think that's very important to understand how things work. Um, in computers are very complex. So like showing that you understand that. I would have people focus on, okay, what domain, um, just beyond technology, should I should I be in? Maybe it's healthcare, maybe it's um, you know the food food service industry. There's some large companies in there. Maybe it's retail, um, but those don't. And why I say that those domains are never going to go away, and they're always going to have jobs because at the end of the day, it's like okay, AI is here. Okay, well. Yeah, but re, you know, retail being retail, like people still want to interact with humans and, and all that. The, like you need to create a curated experience. I don't think, I, I don't know what, what year, um, it will probably be a few generations where someone, people are going to be comfortable saying to their phone, Hey, just order me an 85 inch TV, whatever is good. Right. And then it just shows up at your door. Like no doubt that will happen in the future. Assuming we all have jobs and money, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take it all away. But, um, you know, there's always going to be that kind of white glove service that these companies offer in these specific domains. And I think what people should focus on, if you like software engineering systems and all that, um, you should definitely, you know, attach yourself to AI. But look at those verticals to say, how can I use this to, you know, make this um, industry a little bit better? So it's a good idea. I like that focusing on the domain and focusing on the problems under, under that domain umbrella. Do you feel like there are a lack of resources available for software engineers, be it at a corporate, large corporate level, or even a small startup? Do you feel like there's a lack of support cultivating those skills, not just the how to write code, but I mean, some of those other problem solving skills or emotional intelligence, communication skills, those ones that allow you, you talked about adaptability earlier, allow you to be adaptable and be really valuable. Do you think that we're missing something there, that there's a gap in providing that type of support, furthering education development for software engineers specifically? Um. I think the answer you would probably get if you looked at the data of these big companies, guys, I've been at the big companies poked around a little bit. There are learning platforms and opportunities there. Um, the people that run those programs, the first thing that we probably say is, well, you know, like less than 10% of employees utilize this. So what are they doing? And I, I think that can be um, one of two things, right? I've, I've been in jobs where absolutely there's no way like you can learn because there is so much work coming at you and so much like day-to-day -day interaction. One, you're exhausted by the end of the day, but two, there's no, there's not an hour of time that you can like take and go do something yourself. 
So yeah, like 100%, I think companies, you know, when we think about the productivity of something like an AI or artificial intelligence, how our productivity just keeps rising, rising, rising. I think it's beholden on these companies and to like offer that to employees to say, you know what, this is just a mandate. Every Friday, you know, and you can start small and I'm sure like some CC, <laughs> C-level suites are like, what are you talking about? That's like 20% of the time. At the end of the day, you kind of have to be hold, beholden to them to cultivate them and to grow them and to be better. Um, I think you're going to get positive gains, even if it's like, well, 10% of their time is off, you know, learning. But I think it's up to good leadership at these companies to coach, mentor, guide to say, hey, let's, you're very interested in that over there. The company needs this over here that you might have not been aware of. How do we mesh these up and like create a success? Um, so I think a lot of that just kind of comes down to good leadership and, um, you know, doing that type of thing for employees where you're, you're actually setting aside the time and understanding when they're, you know, a bit too much, but you hit the nail on the head. If if you're an employee out there and you are not actively progressing yourself beyond what your current job stipulates, you just need to do. Um, just be aware you might have a rough time the next time you go look for a job and someone doesn't need that exact scenario, you to fulfill that exact scenario. They're going to want more from you or, you know, different. So you, so you're at this point, almost 20 years under your belt. What's next for you? Again, in light of how you stay in love with your craft, how do you look at the next 10 years or 15 years or, or however long your career is? Uh, that's, that's actually an interesting question because I think today I have less of a clear picture than I did 20, 10 years ago. Um, I think today a lot of us out there are probably kind of very interested to see what happens and how it happens um, and kind of, you know, how things are going to change. And, and honestly, like for me personally, it's like, do I go kind of contribute to that change? Do I kind of hang back and wait? I've read a lot of like people that when they get laid off, you know, it's, it's hard to, get laid off from a job that you feel kind of defined you, right? Like I've had these roles in the past. This is who I am. And now when you're going to look for those similar roles, they might not exist anymore. So I, I think, um, yeah, I, me personally, I, I'm the type of person at the end of the day that can do, I can find meaning in a lot of different things. So I've gone on job interviews where it's like, hey, do you want to be an IC? Do you want to be a people leader? And probably the response they don't like is, oh, I, I'll do, I can do both. I'll do whatever you want. Um, for, for, you know, and by the way, don't say the job interview, I'll do whatever you want. It's, it, for, you know, it turns people off because um, you're not showing your strengths coming through. Uh, but the reality is I can find value in any of those things. I think at the phase I'm in in my life, um, I still like to roll up my sleeves, write code. I still love to mentor people. You know, I coach my son's soccer team and my daughters. Um, but in terms of life trajectory, um, it's really a focus on I have three little humans running around. How do I How do I build them up? and prepare them for, for life. Um, while myself, you know, putting in the time to work on myself to further my skill set or, you know, my passion of what I want to carry out within a business and, you know, in various roles. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I can tell you what it's not. It's not staying up till 2am coding. I think that part of my life is, is probably a little past and uh, there's, there's, there's just too much diminishing returns for me to put my time into, into that. So. Well, I appreciate that immensely. I appreciate all the insights you shared. I think a lot of people feel the way you do and like, how do I continue to fill my bucket? What's next? And life has seasons, right? You're in a different season of life than you were 15, 20 years ago. So I think it's also listening to that part of yourself and saying, what does this next season 
demand of me personally, professionally, and being honest about that. So I, I do really appreciate it. I think so many engineers have uh, gotten into this because they loved a particular facet of it. And the career trajectory has taken them away from it, either through leading people and getting away from having their hands on the keyboard or through disillusionment or through the fact that it's just like, I've solved these problems over and over again. I need something else, right? So I, I have a lot of those conversations. So I really appreciate all of the insights today into that. Yeah, I mean, I will say um, it's one of those things where I think we would probably be better served and hopefully someone doesn't uh, <laughs> hate me for this, but I think we might need to work a little bit less. I, I think working a little bit less, taking a step away, maybe going for a walk or taking a day off and thinking about things, right? Like kind of deeply thinking about that and taking that approach into, you know, a job or a workplace to say, you know, I know I can just write these lines of code and I've done it before, but actually taking a step back to say, but what are we trying to do here? Right? Like, is is this feature or this, you know, this little mangly bug, is it worth like the 20 plus hours I'm going to spend on this week? Or how about I just go take a walk, come back, you're refreshed and say, you know what, let's try, you know, something potentially new to just avoid this problem altogether. I'm not saying that's going to work in, in every use case, but I, I think we as a society and kind of everyone, um, we should be thinking about if the productivity gain, gains that we're going to get through AI and robotics are really going to come, why are we working so much, right? You know, I just I worry about the sustainability about that. Like you, you, you say when you talk to these engineers, um, you know, at the end of the day, all of us as engineers, we're probably hired to make something more efficient. So we, we need to think about okay, I, I'm hired for this role to, you know, make it more efficient or make it easier, you know. So I, I think we should, you know, heed the advice that our, our companies, how, how do we make ourselves more efficient um, while also giving us ourselves some time, so. I agree. Well, Sean, thank you so much for joining me today on Couple of Conversations, for sharing these insights. I think there's a lot of people who sympathize, empathize, absolutely feel the way that you do. And it's nice to hear a, a familiar voice who's going through the same thing. And I also really appreciate the reminder that we also need to work on ourselves and take care of ourselves because we're in this for the long haul. This is this is a long road to walk down and we can't get we can't get burnt out in, for what, right? So figuring out why we're doing this and how we can do it long term. So thank you so much again for joining me today. Thank you so much, Lauren.